All right. I want to do a message this morning on the church age. A while back I was listening to an older message that I had done, I don't even know, probably a year and a half ago, something like that. Non-Dispensational Christian Contradictions was the name of the message. And I said in that message that I'm actually going to do a sermon specifically on the church age. Well, I never did. So I'm finally getting around to it. So let's begin this morning in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Now, what is the very first time that the word church is mentioned? And we've been over this here numerous times in our different sermons, but one of the one of the things that you can do with your King James Bible, because it's Holy Spirit inspired, is you can look at what we call the law of first mention. The very first time a word appears, a lot of times it's defined. And you can get a sense of what that word's going to mean throughout the rest of the Bible. So look here in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. Uh, it says here, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now there are two interpretations, the right one and the wrong one. The right one is that Jesus Christ is the rock that the church is built on. Okay, other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. It says back there in Corinthians. Okay, now the Catholic interpretation is, Thou art Peter, and he is the rock that the church is built on. Let me show you the problem with that. Jump down to verse 22. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. He didn't want to hear about Jesus dying on the cross. And look at Jesus' reaction. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense unto me, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. So you got a pretty rough foundation if Peter is the rock that the church is built on. <laughs> okay, I'm not trying to cut on Peter. Of course, he turned out to be you know, a, a great man of God. But it's ridiculous to say that the church is founded upon Peter. It's not. The church started with Jesus Christ. Okay, so you see the first reference there to the church, and it's about being founded by Jesus Christ and on Jesus Christ, which is exactly true. But now turn over just uh, two chapters to Matthew 18, verse 15. We're going to see something kind of interesting here. Matthew 18, verse 15 through 17. It says here, Moreover, if thy brother... If, excuse me. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Okay, so the first three references to the word church are in the book of Matthew. And that's those are the only three there. Then it goes to Acts is the next time that the word church shows up. But let me ask a question. Are the first references to church, are they in the Old Testament or the New Testament? Old. Yeah. People say, oh, it's in the book of Matthew. It's in Matthew, so it must be the New Testament. No. Let me show you why that doesn't work. Turn to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15. Of course, I covered this in the non-dispensational Christian contradictions sermon, but we're going to hit it here again just to kind of define some things. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15. And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death for the redemption of the transgression that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. When did the New Testament begin? It began with the death of Jesus. That's when it started. That's when everything began. And if you want confirmation of that, there are four places in your King James Bible. We're not going to go to each of them, but uh, Matthew 26, 28 is the first one. Uh, at the Last Supper, Jesus says, 
For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. That also appears in Mark 14.24, Luke 22.20, and 1 Corinthians 11.25 also talks about communion, that we're to do this in remembrance. But it's the blood of the New Testament. That's what begins the New Testament. Okay, It's not the birth of Jesus, it's the death of Jesus and the blood that was shed. A blood the blood sacrifice brought in the New Testament. And that happened at Calvary. Okay, that's where the New Testament begins. So doctrinally speaking, the church actually the word church shows up in the Old Testament first. And I'm going to show you that that's not really a, an issue here. Don't want to get ahead of myself. But just kind of an interesting side note, by the way, I just wanted to throw this in in one of the sermons here. Uh, we have a, a big local church here, Calvary Church. And it's kind of interesting because the word Calvary only appears one time in your King James Bible. It's in Luke 23, 33. Okay, that's the only time that the word Calvary appears in the King James Bible. The NIV removes the word Calvary and they replace it with the skull. Now, the interesting thing is this big huge Calvary church, a couple thousand people go there, they took all their King James Bibles out of the pews a number of years ago and they replaced them with NIVs. But yet they keep the name Calvary on their church. I mean, why not be consistent? If you're going to replace the King James Bible in the pew, why not replace it on the sign out in front of the church? Why not instead of Calvary Church, it should be the Skull Church? (laughs) I mean, that's what it should be. I mean... Just a little interesting side note there. But uh, what is the last reference to the church? Revelation 3.14, and under the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. Right. Okay, so the last reference to the church, I just read the first part of the verse there, by the way, but the the first reference is in Matthew, the last reference is in Revelation 3.14. I'm going to talk more about that in just a minute. What about churches, plural, of church? Well, the first reference is in Acts 9.31. It says here, Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. Speaking about the body of Christ. Okay. Uh, and the last reference to churches is in Revelation 22.16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. So, first reference is in Acts, last reference is in Revelation. Now, the thing that's interesting is the word church and church is does not appear from Revelation 4 the whole way to Revelation 21. You can look it up in a concordance. The word church and churches is not in that tribulation time period. Now, it's really kind of an interesting thing and you want to kind of jump on that and say well, see it proves a pre-tribulation rapture because the church is not in the tribulation well i do believe in a pre-tribulation rapture but you have to be careful not to use things that can be spun around and used back on you let me show you what i mean there's a problem with the thing of saying the word church doesn't appear in the tribulation um, because three times the word church appears Twice in Hebrews and once in James. Now, I believe that doctrinally the books of Hebrew and James are for tribulation saints. So the word church is used there. Now, let me just show you. You say, well, how do you define the word church? Well, turn over, if you're there in Hebrews 9 yet, turn over to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. I'm going to show you a good definition for what a church is supposed to be. And there are some things that, you know, dispensationally are going to overlap. Okay, they're going to be true for basically anybody. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25 says here, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Now that right there is the way that you could define what a church is supposed to be. The assembling of ourselves together. That's what it is. It's an assembly. Now, you know, a lot of people go to Greek and they'll say, well, it's ecclesia and it means a called out assembly. Well, you don't really need Greek. I mean, you can define it right there in your King James Bible. 
Okay, turn over to Hebrews 12, 23. Hebrews 12, 23, you'll see this thing again of the assembly. And actually it says church here too in the same verse. Okay, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. So, the general assembly and church listed in the same verse there. Now go to James chapter 2. James chapter 2 verse 1 says here, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment. And it goes on to say that they respect the guy that's rich in the gay clothing, which of course means, you know, worldly, kind of happy, rich clothing. Just because a bunch of perverts stole a word out of your King James Bible doesn't mean we need to update the King James Bible. I get sick of that. You know, I hear some of that. Well, it shouldn't say gay because that word's changed meanings. No, the world out there stole a word from our King James Bible. Okay, we need to take it back and give the true meaning. But the whole point is there again you see this thing of the assembly. Now, for the majority of church history, the Christians assembled together. And it was always a very dangerous thing. A lot of times they had to meet in secret. They couldn't just say everybody was welcome. And now, I know for a couple hundred years here in America, we've had the thing of the lost being able to be brought into the church. But that's because we had a very safe place to worship here in America. Now, as time goes by and more and more persecution comes down, it's going to have to go back to the thing of you're going to have to be real careful who you let into your assembly. Okay, it says there in Hebrews 10.25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves. That saved people. And when you hit that time of Jacob's trouble, if you miss the rapture for some reason, and you hit that time of Jacob's trouble, you aren't going to be able to let people with the mark of the beast come into your assembly. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Bad idea. And you're going to have to be real careful who you let in. But the point is, uh, the word church is basically defined as an assembly of saved people. Okay, you don't need Greek to prove that. Now, what about the word Christian? Well, we're not going to go to all these verses for sake of time. We have a lot to cover today. Acts chapter 11, verse 26 is the first time that the word Christians shows up. Uh, it says here, And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians. Christians first in Antioch. Not Alexandria, Egypt, by the way, I'd like to add. The next one is in Acts chapter 26, 28. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And the last one is in 1 Peter 4, 16. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. And that's the only references to the word Christian or Christians in the Bible. Kind of interesting, there's only three times that the word Christian or Christians is used. A total of three, I'm saying. Interesting number. So what is the church age? Well, you can debate it, but basically it begins in Acts. Some people say, well, if it would begin with the crucifixion, you know, the New Testament. You know, some people say, no, it began on Pentecost. We're not going to cover that today, you know, which, you know, whatever you believe there, but it basically, it begins in the book of Acts. Uh, it doesn't begin with Paul, like the hyper-dispensationalists teach, because Paul in Romans 16 says about, he names a couple of people and he says, who were in Christ before me? So, the body of Christ was there before Paul. Okay, so, it begins in Acts, and it ends with what? What ends the church age? Rapture. Rapture. Okay. Um the rapture, of course, you can read about that. We have a lot of studies on that. Uh, but 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 58, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18, and Revelation 4, 1 through 2. Okay, now, you can kind of see the thing of that the churches disappear after Revelation chapter 4. And so, there is some application there. I can't totally rule that out. 
salvation in this dispensation in this dispensation is by faith okay works are there just simply for rewards in heaven and there are works meet for repentance okay too there should be good works after salvation and if you see somebody that professes to be saved and they just live just like the lost world well you know i don't think that it, they actually got saved it's not about somebody a carnal christian or whatever I'm talking about somebody that just doesn't live at all for the Lord. Uh, number three, Christians right now in this dispensation are eternally secure. We're going to cover that in just a little bit. And they're also sealed by the Holy Ghost. That's part of being eternally secure. Ephesians 1.13 and 4.30. And the majority of our doctrine right now is found in the Pauline epistles. Okay, with the rest of the Bible being there for instruction and righteousness. And you can find doctrine in the Gospels, in some of the other books too, um, and even in the Old Testament. There are some things that overlap, but the whole thing is you have to study, as it says in 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, and it says there, workman. Okay, it takes work to rightly divide the word of truth. That's why a lot of modern Christians don't like dispensationalism, because it takes a lot of study and a lot of time. And they don't want to do that. They just want it to be quick and let's just get this over with. It doesn't work that way. But now I want to go on to the second part of this message. Um, a couple months ago, uh, we kind of were talking, and Derek and I were talking the one time, and he kind of made a statement and it got me to thinking, he said, basically, what if the Pauline epistles are actually representing the life of a Christian? The order of the Pauline epistles represent a, a, the spiritual growth of a Christian. And we kind of worked it out. You know, we were kind of talking different times, you know, how, how the system would work out. Well, I set it aside for a while, and it's been a couple months now, and, and you know, I got back to it again, and, and the Lord gave me the rest of it. But it's actually very interesting. Okay? Uh, and we're going to go through that. We're, I'm going to show you how your New Testament books are actually laid out to mirror the life of a Christian. Okay? You begin with the book of Acts. Acts is salvation. Okay? You read through the book of Acts sometime, and you'll see that thing of how the Jews, you know, rejected Jesus nationally as their Messiah, and it went to the Gentiles. And you see this thing of the gospel being preached, and it's about salvation. So we'll say Acts is salvation. Now what's Romans? What's the book of Romans? If you could say what the whole book is basically about. Well, I believe that if, if we were to categorize it, it would be about justification. Turn back to Romans 3.20. We're just going to hit a couple verses and go through this. Thing. Romans chapter 3 verse 20 okay you came to a point and you said I need to get saved and you pray to the Lord and you and you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior now this is where things begin okay Romans chapter 3 verse 20 says therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight for by the law is the knowledge of sin Okay, now that law is written in your heart, everybody's heart. Not you know, once you get saved, then then the law is there and it convicts you. No, if you're lost, even the most lost man knows that it's wrong to kill, that it's wrong to steal, it's wrong to lie. You know, the lost man knows that. Okay, so the law is there to convict of sin. It's not that you have to keep the law to be saved. Uh, drop down to Romans chapter four, verses six through eight. So you realize, I can't keep the law here. I need Jesus Christ. Uh, verse 6 here, Romans chapter 4, verse 6. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. You can't keep the law, so God gives you righteousness through Jesus Christ. Verse 7, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin okay now that word there impute or imputation or imputed 
that's been taken out of a lot of the modern Bible versions. They take that word out. And that's one of the most important words in your entire Bible right there. Because what you need to understand is about salvation. It's not anything that you've done. And it's not anything that you need to continue doing to be saved. Okay, It's what Jesus Christ did on the cross. That's the blood that washes those sins away. And what, and we're going to see this definition later, but what happens at salvation is your sinful life, your sins of the past and the present and the future are taken and they are exchanged with Jesus Christ's perfect life. Okay? His righteousness, his pure perfect life is imputed to you. You've wronged God, you owe God, and you can't pay it. But Jesus Christ does. Okay, His righteousness is given to you. It's imputed to you. That's very important. And you need to understand that right when you get saved. Because if you don't, you're just going to keep trying to do good works and, and never really know for sure. You need to get that thing in your head, I'm justified, not because of myself, but because of what Jesus Christ did. Okay, turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Verse 35. It says here, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Let me just stop there for a second. God did not promise you a good life if you get saved. <laughs> okay? You're going to be hated if you're really truly saved. But let, let's continue on here. Verse 37. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay? You are justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. And you need to get that thing down right when you get saved. So, what comes next? Okay, you came under conviction. You got saved. You understand that Jesus Christ paid it all on the cross. So now, what usually happens next in the life of a Christian? Well, then you go to the next two books, First and Second Corinthians. And what's the main theme of those two books? carnal baby Christians. Okay, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. This church, the church at Corinth, Paul has more trouble with them than any of the other churches. And the whole way through, he's rebuking them and they're not taking it all that well. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But uh, let's read here, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? This was not a strong church. Okay, and when somebody gets newly saved and they know they're saved they are a baby christian okay you can't avoid that you can't become get saved and become a veteran christian overnight it doesn't happen every christian that gets saved has to go through that baby time period where they need to be fed with milk and too often times what happens is you get a new christian and they start getting meat and too strong a doctrine and they get messed up you have to start out slow with a new Christian. You have to start out. They have to learn to crawl before they learn to walk. That's just the way it is. Um, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm making some more comments here on the Corinthian church, but I want to read a little bit more here. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. 
It says here, But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Now, let me just stop there real quick. What was the thing that Satan offered to Eve? Knowledge. Knowledge. Yeah. Yeah, that she could know good and evil. It was a good thing, but he offered her wisdom. Now, what happens to a lot of these early young Christians, these little babes in Christ, they're offered some false prophet comes along and he says, let me explain the beautiful truths of, of Calvinism. You know, and the guy's a hyper-Calvinist, you know, and they get all messed up. Well, let me explain uh, soul sleep. Or they, they get all these big doctrinal things and they're, the simplicity of their salvation is quickly lost because they, they get it all messed up in this this weird system. And that happens a lot. And it's even worse today because it's not the teaching of a local church, you know, which, you know, couldn't be messed up in itself. But if you have a good local church, well, you know, you'd probably be okay. But on the Internet, you can get on there and you can you can get so messed up doctrinally. I mean, it's just incredible the amount of false prophets that are on there. I mean... It's, it's bad. So you can be corrupted very quickly from the simplicity that is in Christ. And look what happens here. Verse 4. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Paul's saying, these false prophets that are going to come along and that are coming along, you can read the context there. They are coming along and deceiving the Corinthian believers. He's saying, you're going to bear with them. You're going to accept them. You're going to listen. And you're going to fall for it. And that's a lot of times what happens to baby Christians. And I want to make another point. Watch out for any quote-unquote church that has major doctrinal stands that are founded upon First or Second Corinthians. Watch out for that. Okay? I'll give you a couple examples. Charismatics. Healing and speaking in tongues are two of their major things, their major themes. Have you received the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Speaking in unknown tongues. Where are they getting their main doctrine from? 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. That's where they're getting it. But let me ask you a question. Where are the instructions to speak in tongues and to heal in all the other books of the Pauline epistles. Where's that? It isn't. It's not in there. I'll give you another example. A required cloth head covering. There's only one chapter in your entire New Testament that talks about the head covering. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, should you base major doctrine on that? And I mean, I heard, a, I just recently read a book uh, by a, a brother down in Redline wrote this. And he was saying, and you know, I, I'm, I try to stick with the Bible, but some of this historical argument stuff is okay. But he was saying basically that in Corinth there were prostitutes that would go around. All the other women wore veils on their heads and on their face, kind of like the Muslims do. But the prostitutes didn't wear anything like that. And so the guy was saying if there was a veil, maybe, you know, they should have worn it. Or, and I, I thought, well, you know, whatever. But... The point is, this instruction about a head covering, and I, I don't believe it's anything but hair, by the way, um, but this instruction only appears to the first Corinthian, you know, to, or to the believers at Corinth. Where's it at for the rest of the churches? It's not in there. Why would you base a major doctrinal stand on the book of Corinthians? Another one I'll give you real quick here before we continue is the modern apostate house church people. They base their whole statement, their whole everything, on 1 Corinthians 14, 26, where it talks about every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath, you know, an interpretation. And then he says, let all things be done decently and in order, you know. And they say that that means there should be no pastor and that everybody should be speaking whenever they want. And I've gotten in, into, you know, arguments with some of these guys and stuff online that's the way it's supposed to be. Oh, you have a one-man show there. And I say, what about the First Timothy 3 about the bishop? Well, you know, and they won't answer it. 
So again, why would you base everything on one verse out of 1 Corinthians? It's a problem. And it, you know, it's an interesting little point here before we go to the next uh, church. Interesting little thing here is it's funny because babies actually do the three things that I just mentioned. They speak in unknown tongues. <laughs> you know, they like to put funny things on their head and they like to talk out of turn. Something to think about yeah, as we hear our nursery back here. All right. But now what happens when you have carnal Christians? A lot of times, what's the reaction to that? Legalism. Go the opposite direction. Turn to the book of Galatians. Some people as a way to, to combat carnality, and, and you read about the church in Corinth too, there was fornication. There was a major problem there. They were committing fornication and, and some very, very bad forms of that. So the next step that a lot of Christians will take, they come out of the baby stage as a Christian, but then they go the wrong direction. They go to legalism. They go the, the opposite direction. So you have Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law, law or by the hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? They were being told by Jews in the area there that they had to start going back under the law and keeping the law and everything else. And you don't have to do that. Okay? Turn over to Galatians chapter 5, verse 4. It says here, Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Don't think that you're going to be justified by the law. Okay, you should do what you can to keep your flesh down, to keep your flesh in subjection, but don't spend all of your time trying to perfect your flesh. Okay, you're just going to end up not doing much for the Lord. And that's what a lot of Christians do. They get saved. They know, hey, I'm justified. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that pays for my sins. I don't want to be carnal. But then they go into legalism. And we have a lot of it around here. You know, I mean, how does driving around a black vehicle sanctify you? You know, now I'm for a lot of the stuff that the Mennonites do. I'll tell you what, they have some good standards. I'm for a lot of it. But like Mennonites and Amish especially, there's a lot that they do. It's just not necessary. And it can actually lead to problems. Uh, and, you know. Unfortunately, I know the Mennonites will do it somewhat. There are some soul-winning efforts of the Mennonites, but like with Amish, I don't think I've ever heard of any kind of a soul-winning outreach that they do. You know, it's just kind of they spend their time trying to keep their traditions, which is a problem. Okay? And it leads to something else. If you are trying to work your way and, and stay under the law and keep the commandments and everything else, what's going to happen? You're going to doubt your salvation. You're not going to believe in eternal security. And all and the holiness type of people and a lot of these other people, they don't believe in eternal security. I got into an issue with an old-time Methodist guy, the one-time kind of an argument, and he told me that I was wrong for believing in eternal security, that that was a heresy. <laughs> it's not a heresy. And in fact, that's the next step that you need to get to as a Christian. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 1. As you grow as a Christian and you see that you can't be justified by the works of the law, you get to a point where you realize who your salvation is coming from. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13. It says here, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. There again, another very important, two very important phrases there. Verse 13, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Very important. Verse 14, until the redemption of the purchased possession. 
you are bought with a price. Your life is not your own. You are actually purchased. When you get saved, that's the reason you can't lose your salvation, because God actually buys you with his blood. Okay? That's right there. Once righteousness is imputed to you, to you once you accept Jesus Christ's perfect nature, you can't lose that again. Okay, you cannot lose your salvation. And that's where you need to get to. If you're convinced that you have to keep the commandments, you need to get out of that step and go to the next one and say, <clears throat> it's not that you want to live in sin. You don't continue in sin that grace may abound. No, God forbid. But the point is, you have to get to a point where you realize my salvation is not depending on my righteousness, on my good works. I'm sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So the next step there is eternal security. Now, if you believe that, when you start to believe I'm sealed, God's promised, I am his purchased possession, I can't lose my salvation, what does that lead next to? It, lead ne it leads next to what Philippians mentions, boldness. Philippians chapter 1 verse 14. When you are assured of your salvation, when you know you can't lose it, and you know that it's a thing where your works are merely there for reward, heavenly reward, not to keep you saved, then it will lead to boldness many times. Look at Philippians chapter 1 verse 14. And many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Okay, Paul's example of going through prison and, and being persecuted and everything else led these Philippian believers to be much more bold. Philippians 3.10 It says here that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. You want resurrection power? Well, you're going to have to give up some things. We're going to get into that in just a little bit. Philippians 4.13. This one you ought to have memorized. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Should you have boldness? Yeah. And I'll tell you, you can say, well, that's easy. No, it's not. Paul had to pray for boldness. You know, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly. You know, that's not always easy. But if you know, I mean, you got to get that thing straightened out in your head. Why are you witnessing to somebody? Are you doing it to keep yourself saved? Well, then it's going to be motivated out of fear. You should be doing it out of motivation of Christ died for me. I want to do this for him. You know, I'm doing it out of love, out of charity. Okay, that should lead to boldness. And you can do all things, by the way, through Christ. All things. Whatever you're supposed to do, you should be doing it. Now, what comes next as a Christian? Once you've established boldness, what comes next? Well, understanding. Turn to Colossians 1. Colossians 1, 9 through 10. It says here, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Are you increasing in the knowledge of God? You know, I talked to a, a chiropractor the one time, and he said, uh, you know, this. they had a pastor come and to their church, and he said, have you learned anything new in the past seven years? And, and he was like, you know, I don't think I really have. And I thought, huh? <laughs> you haven't grown or learned anything new, you know, about the Lord in seven years? That's bad, <laughs> you know. If I don't learn something new from the Lord or whatever... Every day, it's I consider it kind of a bad thing. I mean, you know, you ought to be increasing in the knowledge of the Lord. And it's not that, oh, well, the old stuff I used to believe in, now I don't have to believe in that anymore. No, that's not it. It's just that you should see new things that the Lord's doing in the world and relate it to Scripture. And as you're reading through your Bible, the Lord should be revealing things to you. So it's important to have 
understanding. And it's kind of interesting too. Um, as you get assurance of salvation and you start to get boldness to witness to people, part of your understanding is actually going to come from being on the battlefield for the Lord. Actually going out and talking to people, actually going out and witnessing, actually going out and, you know, having experiences with people. That's part of your understanding. It's not enough just to sit somewhere and study the Bible. That's important. But you also need to have some application. You also need to get in confrontations with people. You know, if you just have head knowledge and no actual experience, you're not going to get very far. So it's important. And by the way, nobody can really teach this to you. You have to go out and experience it for yourself. Okay? You have to have some battle experience. Now, what's going to come when you start to get some understanding? Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6. The thing that comes when you're growing in the Lord and you start to understand what's going on, you've been saved for a while, you've been in the Bible for a while, you've been praying, you've been witnessing, you're starting to get some boldness, getting some understanding. What comes next? 1 Thessalonians 1, 6. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. Isn't that interesting? Received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. You mean you can be persecuted and have joy as a result? Yeah, you can. When you are a Bible-believing Christian and you are witnessing to somebody and they attack you and say you're a fanatic, you're a Bible thumper, you're bigoted, narrow-minded, whatever, it shouldn't bother you. It should actually give you joy in the Holy Ghost because you know you're doing right. If Jesus Christ was persecuted, you know how are you going to get out of it? It, it? it should be there. But that's what happens. That's what's going to come to you. That's what you can expect. And it's not a bad thing. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 3. It says here, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. Now this isn't a thing of Catholic suffering, where you're whipping yourself or beating yourself, or forcing yourself into some kind of a system of suffering. No. It's just you live right with the Lord, you're preaching, you're being bold in your witness, suffering is going to come. It's just going to happen. Okay? And that's, you know, what will happen as you increase in the knowledge and in your boldness. You know, knowledge of the Bible and, and of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's just what happens. Now, what's the next step? You go, you know, down through this thing, you start getting some persecution. What comes next? after you've been in, on the battlefield for Jesus Christ for a while, well, what's First and Second Timothy about? Ministry. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 18. First Timothy 1, 18. says here, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them might mightest war a good warfare. It's kind of interesting. Both here in 1 Timothy and in 2 Timothy, Paul likens ministry to being a soldier. And you can see those applications there. There's a lot of, you know, very profound things there. Okay, but the whole thing is you're not ready to lead troops until you yourself have been on the battlefield for a while. You know, you have to go through some experiences. You have to be shot at, spiritually speaking. You know, you have to know how to defend yourself. You know how to things work. You know, it has to be there. 
And if you get into ministry too quickly, the Bible talks about um, over in 1 Timothy 3, uh, verse 6, it talks about not a novice. If you skip some of these steps that I've been talking about here, you don't have boldness, you don't have understanding, you don't have e- believe in eternal security, you're not ready to be in ministry. Okay, You have to go through some of that stuff. Um, and it's interesting there, it says about, in uh, 1 Timothy 3, it talks about church leaders, and it says that they, basically, that they need to be proved. Okay, you have to go through some things before you're really ready to be a leader in, in ministry. Turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Trying to get this whole thing into one study. I mean, there's a lot more that could be said here. I'm just kind of gliding over the top of this subject here. Just hitting a couple of verses to, to keep the time down. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. We'll read that quick. It says here, Thou therefore, my son... And by the way, Paul keeps calling Timothy his son. He's his spiritual son. And there are, as when you get into ministry, you will have young men that are saved under your ministry, and you teach them and you kind of bring them up, spiritually speaking. It says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. There you have a man of God leads a man, younger man to the Lord, and then he imparts that, the wisdom of the Bible, the understanding, takes him out onto the battlefield, shows him how things work, and then that younger man is supposed to do the same to the men in his ministry. That's how the gospel is you know, carried out. That's the way it's supposed to be. Verse 3, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if any man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. You know, that's another thing that's really, really bad about a lot of these modern churches. They're not striving lawfully. Oh, well, they got a lot of members and they're getting a lot done and all this stuff and they're doing a lot of nice stuff. But it's not striving lawfully. They're doing things that the Bible never told you to do. A lot of the socialism that's in the modern church, going and raking people's leaves in their yard and food drives and clothing drives and all this other stuff, those things are good, but they're doing those so that they can forsake the mission of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And a lot of these modern churches, you go there, you won't hear the gospel of salvation. You won't hear them talking about hell. You won't. They won't offend anybody. Okay, the offense of the cross has ceased. That's what a lot of these churches are. They are not striving lawfully. So when you get into ministry, there are a lot of corners that you can cut. There are a lot of ways that you can get out of offending people. And you can grow your ministry and you can make a lot of money. But you're not going to be crowned unless you strive lawfully. And that's why, again, you need to be, have a little bit of experience, you know, before you get into ministry. Okay, now we're going to go next to Titus. After you get into ministry, what comes next? Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. What do we have in Titus? We have spiritual maturity. It says here, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. Some important things there. Verse 3, The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. So you see spiritual maturity there. And you go to the average church, a lot of the older people are not following those verses right there. Okay, they want to be like the youth. Shouldn't be that way. Now turn over to Titus 3.14. I'm going to show you something else that's very important. Titus 3.14 says here, And that ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. 
when you get into ministry, there's there's always so much to do, and you know there's a lot to do and not enough time to do it, kind of a thing. And what you have to get figured out the longer you're in ministry is what should I be spending my time on here? What is going to produce the most spiritual fruit? I didn't say the most money. I said the most spiritual fruit. What's going to produce the most spiritual fruit? What do I? What should I be concentrating on? You know, that's important. And that's a mark of spiritual maturity. Don't waste time <clears throat> fighting the wrong battles. Okay? Pick something and fight that. And that goes for anybody, by the way. It's not just for a pastor. Now, one more book here to look at. Philemon. Now, what would Philemon be? Well, I believe it would be self-sacrifice. I think is what's going on there. Um, let's look here a couple verses. Philemon 9 down through 11. It says here, Yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such an one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. Paul, as an older man, was concerned more for this younger man named Onesimus. Excuse me. Okay, now look at uh, verse 18. Here you have a, a great definition of imputation. If he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. Now see, when you get older in the ministry, you know, you aren't going to mind seeing a young man coming up through the ranks and, and doing well and everything. When you get spiritually mature, you'll actually try to help younger men. And you actually put yourself down and you'll make sacrifices to help a young man in ministry. Okay? So, self-sacrifice, I think, is, is the end thing there. And, you know, this isn't a real, real detailed study, I realize. I mean, you could, you know, go into a lot more detail here. I just wanted to kind of hit this as part of the church age thing. Uh, but, in conclusion, we're going to go to Second. Timothy chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Okay, 2 Timothy 4, 6 and 7 says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Now, what I went over today, there are 10 different points that you will have to go through as you grow as a Christian. Number one, justification. You get saved. Now we're talking about your Christian life. Justification. Carnality. Okay? Legalism. Eternal security. Boldness. Understanding. Persecution. Ministry. Spiritual maturity. And sacrifice. Self-sacrifice. Those you know, I, I'm not trying to set some, you know, this is set in stone or whatever, but I'm just saying this is a basic outline. Now, as far as that as a course, as a Christian, how are you doing? Are you stuck on uh, number two, carnality? Are you stuck in First Corinthians somewhere as the majority of your doctrine? How about legalism? You say, I'm not carnal. I, I don't fool around with stuff like that. What about legalism? Shouldn't be stuck there. How about eternal security? Have you got that figured out? Are you resting in the finished work of Jesus Christ? Boldness. How about that? How how bold are you with your witnessing? How bold are you as a Christian? You know, there's a bumper sticker I saw the one time. It's very well known. And it says, if you were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? There should be. How bold are you? Understanding. How much time are you spending studying not only the Word of God, but there are also books that you should be reading that, that can help you. You know, older men of God that are out there that have learned things, that have studied things. Some very good books out there to study about the Bible. And, and of course, understanding is also going out and applying the Bible in your own life and being bold in your witness. You'll also get understanding that way. Persecution. Are you getting along with everybody? 
If you are, you're not living right with the Lord. I'll tell you that. If you don't, if you get along with every member of your family, and you get along with all your co-workers, and you get along with all your neighbors, there's a problem there. Jesus Christ didn't get along with everybody. Something to think about. What about the ministry? Have you gotten to a point now where you can be in some kind of a ministry? And that doesn't mean full-time ministry necessarily. Okay, some are called to that, some aren't. But there should be some kind of a ministry that you have of reconciliation. Tracks or get on the internet or talk to people or whatever. There should be some sort of a ministry. What about spiritual maturity? Are you maturing spiritually? And self-sacrifice. Charity was actually... You know, a good way to mention that. You say, well, where are you at, Brian? Well, I'm probably about Second Timothy. <laughs> I'm not real spiritually mature. You know, I, I say some, I mean, I've only been in ministry now for a couple of years. You know, these guys, well, I've been in ministry for 30 years. Well, I'm not even close to that. Okay. Uh, there's some things I still need to learn. Sometimes my anger gets the best of me and I say stupid things and I offend people and, you know, when I shouldn't offend. I, I still have some things to learn there. And self-sacrifice, well, that's a little bit easier for me to make. I'd, that's not too bad. But uh, So where are you at in your growth as a Christian? Are you Have you been stuck in a certain area? Well, move forward. So that's going to be it for this morning. Um, thank you for listening. And uh, if you have any questions, of course, you know, always feel free to contact us. We'll get back to you as soon as we can. So that's it. Thank you. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA, 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.